Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Sandy Baird and I'm here with the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement for another Wednesday night public discussion of important issues. And uh, reminding everybody that this is a discussion. So please chime in with all of your disagreements or agreements and comments. Tonight we have with us Rob Williams. Rob Williams is a professor at a lot of places, right? Champlain. Uh, UBM, right? St. Michael's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And has been a professor at Burlington College many years ago with some of us. And he also has a, a bachelor's degree from Princeton. And that's kind of surprising given, given the fact that Rob is a very, is a dissenter in a lot of ways. And he also has a PhD from the University of New Mexico. Uh, and he also edits a and publishes a, a, a journal called the Vermont Independent. He has been active politically for years and he's certainly an engaged citizen, really of the world, but also of Vermont. So Rob, Rob is with us tonight to talk about what's called the Great Reset, maybe to explain a little bit and also to ask for any questions and to discuss that idea. So go ahead, Rob. Nice to have you. Sandy, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Welcome everybody. So nice to see some familiar faces. Um, and I look forward to doing this again um, face to face very soon. Um, if you don't have a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper, I, we're gonna go retro here. We're gonna go analog. Um, maybe grab a pen or pencil and piece of paper because I'm gonna ask you um, for your thoughts on a couple of things as we move through this, what I hope will be a conversation. Um, so uh, everybody can see the screen there, yes? It's okay? I can yes. make it a little bigger. How's that? Yes. So let me give you a quick outline what I'm thinking about for tonight, kind of approaching this. So Sandy has welcomed everybody. Um, I'd like to, in, in a moment, read just a quick excerpt from a new book I'm working on called COVIDtopia, which has everything to do with the Great Reset, as you'll see. Um, before we get there, though, I'd like to recommend um, two books. If you have not yet read COVID-19, The Great Reset, uh, anybody read, oops, anybody read this book? Show of no. hands. Who wrote it? Uh, this is written by these two gentlemen here, Klaus Schwab, who is the founder and current chairman of the World Economic Forum, and Thierry Mallory, who is uh, a Frenchman very much involved. <laughs> so um, take note of the title, COVID-19 colon, the Great Reset. To understand the Great Reset, you have to understand COVID-19. And I would say that COVID-19, the Great Reset, is probably the single best authoritative source on, shall we say, the pros, the positive benefits, real or imagined, uh, of the Great Reset. And then there's a brand new book uh, for a second point of view published by our own Vermont press, Chelsea Green. This is a book that sold 100,000 copies in advance on Amazon in the month of April last month before it even hit the stands. This is a book that has, is now on every single bestseller book list in the country, except for, wait for it, the New York Times. And that is this book right here. The Truth About COVID-19, Exposing the Great Reset, Lockdowns, Vaccine Passports, and the New Normal. Why We Must Unite in a Global Movement for Health and Freedom, written by jo Dr. Joseph Mercola and Ronnie Cummins, with a foreword by the great environmental lawyer, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who helped save the Hudson River here in New York City, which I am looking at right now from my perch at my mother's little apartment here in Osning, New York. Um, so, uh, one more time, COVID-19, colon, The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab and Terry Mallory, and The Truth About COVID-19, Exposing the Great Reset, Lockdowns, Vaccine Passports, The New Normal, Why We Must Unite in a Global Movement for Health and Freedom. Um, I just interviewed Ronnie Cummins, who, if you don't know, is the founder and current head of the um, Organic Consumers Association. This is a global organization devoted to organic food and policy. They've got 2 million members on Facebook, although their Facebook page has been much uh, threatened of late. Uh, so you can watch that on YouTube. Um, 
by searching Vermont Independent. And that interview with Ronnie will be near the top of the list. We had a very interesting conversation. He's an interesting guy. I had never met him before. Uh, lives in Minnesota. Okay, um, from there, we're gonna talk a bit about the founder of the World Economic Forum, the guy who coined the phrase, Great Reset. That is Klaus Schwab. We'll have a few things to say about him. Um, and then from there, we're gonna take a look at a couple of very short videos put out by the World Economic Forum about the Great Reset. Um, and then um, I wanna share a few thoughts about um, the relationship between COVID-19 and the Great Reset. And then we'll end with some hopefully dialogue, some hard questions, some good answers. Uh, but along the way, I'm gonna throw out a couple of tasks for you that I hope you'll find fun. Um, any questions about that particular agenda? Our outline there. We're gonna do all that in 90, in, in, in 83 minutes, I hope. At least we're gonna try. Okay. All right, here we go. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And, Lost you. Um, oh, I see we got chat feature going. Oh, Michael, thank you. Yes, you worked with them. Okay, great. Oh, no, no, you, um, we're good. I'm just, uh, I'm just switching up here. Um, can you see uh, chapter one now? Yes. On and identifying the COVID task. Everybody see that? Right. Great. Yeah. So um, this is just a few, uh, a few words about solutions. You know how when you read a book about a particular sort of dilemma the world is struggling with, if they get around to solutions, it's always in the last chapter of the book? How many of uh you -huh. had this experience? Oh, yeah. Always. Yeah, always. Always. So we're going to start with solutions tonight. Um, so this is from chapter one of a book I'm writing called Covetopia. Begin with a beautiful reality. We humans, each of us, is a highly evolved self-organizing system. In our gloriously flawed evolutionary uniqueness, we are comprised of give or take 30 trillion cells, 40 trillion bacteria, and 380 trillion viruses in or on a human body, claims Dr. Anthony Fauci's National Institute of Health Initiative, dubbed the Human Microbiome Project. This was begun about 15 years ago. The Human Microbiome Project. Anybody heard of the Human Microbiome Project? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, you Two of you. Two of you. Oh, good. Great. 380 trillion viruses, you say? Yes, including coronaviruses. Given our astonishingly complex human microbiome, how do we highly evolved humans, both individually and as a species, become healthy, strong, and happy? Dozens of ways. Practicing daily breathing protocols, we humans have invented myriad options for deepening our spiritual life through mindfulness, prayer, and meditation. Cultivating clean water and growing fresh, nutritious food. Pursuing regular exercise outside in nature, walking, hiking, running, swimming, climbing, all of which contribute to our ongoing evolutionary success as a species. Resting every evening, allowing our minds, bodies, and spirits to recuperate from the creative complexities of daily living. Developing relationships with other living beings, plants, animals, and the planet as a whole. Nurturing our complex social ties with family, friends, and colleagues, including, when we are ready, birthing families of our own. Making a living through crafting meaningful livelihoods, creative life-affirming work in the collaborative company of other humans. Harnessing nature for healing when we become diseased from traditional homeopathic remedies such as herbs and other forms of plant wisdom to modern medicines, including for COVID-19, vitamins D and C, quercetin, bromhexine, zinc, hydrochloxychloroquine, ivermectin, and this FDA approved trio, the transplant rejection drug cyclosporine, the cancer drug dacometatib, and the antibiotic salino uh, salinomycin. Millions of years of human wisdom hunted, gathered, grown, and garnered by we sapiens as our species has evolved. In short, we humans know dozens of ways to treat dis-ease without embracing covid catastrophic viral protocols, physical distancing, masking, locking down, staying home in isolation to stay safe, and consuming the news while waiting for the Gates-funded hoosters at the World Health Organization or Dr. Anthony Fauci to tell us it is okay to again resume living a fully human life. 
All of these 2020 imposed COVID protocols directly contradict millennia of what we humans know, how to cultivate health, strength, and happiness for human success. So why then have we collectively forgotten what we have known for millennia? Why have we as a civilization outsourced all human health decision-making to a single suspect science, virology? How did this COVID-topia come to be? So that's just a little bit of sort of hopefully thought-provoking moment from a little project that I'm working on right now. So back to the great reset. So how many of you are familiar with uh, the figure of Klaus Schwab, Herr Schwab? Hey. Herr Schwab? Herr Schwab, yes, he's yeah. German. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. Okay, a few of you, good. And how many of you, show of hands, are familiar with the World Economic Forum? Okay. So um, to understand the Great Reset, which is a term coined by Klaus Schwab through the World Economic Forum, which bills itself as the international public-private partnership organization for charting the course of the world and humanity. Not that uh, they're the only player, of course, by any stretch. There are obviously thousands of organizations at the local and, and state and national level interested in um, events human, shall we say. But certainly the World Economic Forum has been a major player since its founding. Anybody know the year it was founded? I was four years old. Oh my God, that that long ago? I'm not to not to insinuate that you're an old guy or anything, but that long ago. <laughs> 1971. Oh. Uh, it was, uh, Klaus Schwab founded the World Economic Forum as an organization called the European Management Council, uh, and then later rebranded it as the World Economic Forum. So this is an organization that has been in play for 50 years. Um, sorry, is that right? Yeah, 50 years. Um, and originally went by um, the name European Management Council. Um, Klaus Schwab himself is a very interesting figure. Um, if you look at Schwab's resume, let's just say, if you were applying for a job with you, uh, there are gaps, a number of gaps in his resume. Um, it's very hard to find out personal information about Herr Schwab. Um, the researcher who has done the best work that I've been able to find is a Welsh American independent journalist by the name of Johnny Vedmore. And here on this website at vermontindependent.net, I have linked to a couple of longer articles by Johnny Vedmore that give you a pretty good background about Schwab and his family. He has a very interesting history. Um, let me nutshell it for you. Um, uh, Klaus Schwab's father trained as a mechanical engineer uh, in Germany and then went to work for a Swiss company during the 1930s when the Nazis uh, were making their bid for power, the National Socialists. And uh, Schwab's father ended up running this munitions company. They, they built giant turbine fans and got into the nuclear business in the 1940s and 50s, uh, running essentially what became a munitions factory for the Nazi war machine. Um, because they were sort of on the Swiss border, they were like the Swiss kind of playing a number of different sides of the World War II conversation, uh, the Axis side and the Allied side. But um, very interesting history. And not much is known about Schwab himself before he emerged on the global stage in Davos, Switzerland, um, where of course uh, they convene the annual Davos conference every year which is of course co-hosted by the World Economic Forum. So these links here are the best links that I can find and I'm not gonna open them, but you, if you're interested, you can take a deeper dive when you have more time um, into a bit of history and analysis of both Schwab himself um, and the World Economic Forum. Um, so what I've done here to help illustrate the Great Reset is take a couple of screenshots directly from the World Economic Forum uh, website. Um, this is the best sort of nutshell from Schwab himself uh, that captures the importance of this phrase he himself coined, the Great Reset. He, he said, quote, that the pandemic, meaning the COVID-19 pandemic, 
The pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. Founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. The pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. So from that little nugget, of course, he gives us the great reset. I've got to hand it to Herr Schwab, whatever you think about him, he is sort of a master of marketing and branding. He's very good with words and phrases. And um, with my marketing hat on, um, there's, there's a lot to admire about the way in which he and his organization use language strategically. So let's move on. Um, this is a little bit more of a deeper dive into the Great Reset. Um, if I use the phrase the fourth industrial revolution, how many of you know what that means, the fourth industrial revolution? I do. Okay, good. Let's unpack that a little bit because I find when we, we talk about the Great Reset, this Schwabian term, ushering, ushering in what's called the fourth industrial revolution, my first question naturally is, well, what were the first three industrial revolutions? If we're, if we're suddenly moving into a fourth, what were the first three? So he, he defines that here in this little nugget, again, from the World Economic Forum website, which gives us the great reset. He writes, we stand on the brink of a technological revolution. This, I think he wrote this two years ago. We stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. In its scale, scope, and complexity, the transformation will be unlike anything humankind has experienced before. We do not yet know just how it will unfold, but one thing is clear. The response to it must be integrated and comprehensive, involving all, involving all stakeholders of the global polity from the public and private sectors to academia and civil society. So he's kind of teeing up there the fourth industrial revolution for which the Great Reset, driven by the COVID-19, is a catalyst, or as I like to say, the tip of the spear, if you will, the tip of the spear. So in this next paragraph, he gets into the three revolutions that preceded the fourth. The first revolution used water and steam power to mechanize production. So most famously, that was Mr. Watts's steam engine of the 17th century, the 1640s, I believed, when Thomas Newcomen and Mr. Watts invented that, uh, that device. The second industrial revolution uses electric power to create mass production. That was the world of the turn of this past century, the world of Edison, the world of Tesla, etc. The third industrial revolution used electronics and information technology to automate production. That was the world of the past 60 or 70 years, the, uh, the invention of computers, uh, of course, harnessing electricity for digital networks, the invention of the digital um, was the third industrial revolution. And now Mr. Schwab and the World Economic Forum tell us we are on the brink, we are moving into a fourth industrial revolution, the digital revolution that has been occurring since the middle of the last century. And this is the most important sentence of this evening. The fourth industrial revolution is characterized by a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. I wanna read that again. The fourth industrial revolution is characterized by a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, that was my reaction when I first started getting into this several years ago. And, um, and it's very important for us to understand, regardless of how we feel about the Great Reset, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and the COVID tip of the spear, what Schwab and the World Economic Forum have in mind, and if we want to broaden it out to talk about what I like to call the Davos crowd, the Davos crowd. This is Bill Gates. This is the front man for the Irish rock band U2, Mr. Bono. This is Klaus Schwab. These are financial, global financial capitalists um, and 
corporate entrepreneurs, and the World Economic Forum's, of course, public partner in all of this is the United Nations. And if you're familiar with the history of the United Nations, it's a fascinating and complex history. Um, but think of the World Economic Forum and the United Nations as really sort of uh, very, very closely partnered in this um, uh, championing, shall we say, of the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. One more time, characterized by a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. In other words, they seek to remake the species, humankind, in a new and more powerful, they would say, technological image. That is the goal. And if that sounds incredibly ambitious to you, it certainly is. So let me pause here. Actually, one more slide. I'm going to see if I can enlarge this so we can see it. So this is simply um, a sample from the World Economic Forum of the arenas in which they see this great reset and this fourth industrial rev revolution playing out. Let me make this as big as I can without losing it. Um, everybody see that okay? Yeah, hi, Char. Yeah, yeah. So you can really see that no, no corner of human civilization is left untouched in their vision of a great reset and the fourth industrial revolution. Transportation, trade, investing, public health, education, the internet of things, governance, politics, monetary systems, manufacturing, production, electricity, <laughs> and on it goes. So this is at least on paper and in their books and in their Davos meetings and in the minds of Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates and the UN and the World Economic Forum. This is a comprehensive vision to re, not just reimagine the human experience, but to reinvent the human species. So let me pause there. And I'm curious if anyone has any reactions or questions, feel free again to jot things down as they come to you. But let's stop there for a moment. Okay, can I uh, ask one question? Because the Great Reset was also put forward as the fourth industrial revolution by Naomi Klein, correct? Yes. And what she describes is um, a transition of capitalism also because it is a cap it is also a capitalist economic system that will manage this whole reset it is not um it is it is a partnership essentially isn't it my question is isn't it a partnership between big government big capital big media big pharma um, to kind of manage the resources, the income, and the profit of the world. Is that what you're describing? Excellent. Yeah, I, I think of, um, you're all familiar, I know, with Benito Mussolini's classic definition of fascism. No, I don't think so. We are not. So, Mussolini, Il Duce, in Italy in the 1930s, defined fascism very simply as the merger of corporate and state mm -hmm. power. Yeah. Fascism was the merger of corporate and state power. And I see, I'll tip my hand here a little bit um, because it's in the subtitle of the COVID-topia book I'm working on. I see the great resets catalyzing of a fourth industrial revolution as a move towards what I call global techno-fascism. The marriage of corporate and state right. power driven by these powerful new networked digital technologies. So that's, and, that's and, and some people might say, and Naomi Klein is, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting a read on her. I've known her a long time. Um, and um, I, I think Sandy, correct me if I'm wrong. I think she's fairly critical of this, but I can't quite tell. No, I don't think that's correct. She's, her analysis is the same as yours, I would guess, because I've read it. Her yeah. analysis is the same as yours. And I agree with that analysis. However, she is not critical exactly of it. And I think what's going on is that people are very hesitant to make a criticism of it because it's connected with COVID. 
Yes, and because it's also you know? connected with the global climate change conversation, right? right. Which, which right. Um, Naomi Klein has been sort of deeply involved with for about ten years now. Yeah, I th and I think that's her hesitation. She's yes. not. I think that, but I don't. I'm not certain of that. I just sense yes. that the analysis is the same as yours, but she's not terribly at this moment critical. Yeah, I I, I think that's right. And um, so uh, imagine, uh, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, well-worn phrases trotted out over the years to describe this fourth industrial revolution and this great reset. Some an analysts are suggesting this is just a repackaging of the famous new world order phrase that rolls off the lips of many a US politician on the left and the right over the years. Um, maybe that's true, maybe it's not, I don't know. Um, uh, but that's that's sort of one that's one sort of school of thought there. Um, other reactions to this list here on the screen or to anything we've said so far? Yeah, Robin, jump in. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm curious to know uh, what you think are are the enormous uh, are are the um, solutions to the enormous problems facing us given climate change, population, uh, poverty, and so on. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Yeah, and, in other uh, words, this, we see this as a, as a sort of top-down uh, uh, and uh, controlled by capitalists and so on, but you know, automation is taking place. Uh, so putting people Making them unemployed, should there be, is it bad to have a universal minimum wage? I believe the World Economic Forum supports that. Um, but then, uh, anyway, I'm just interested in what you see as a, a positive ways out here of, yeah, uh, of dire things facing us. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And as you know, I'm a political decentralist. So as you might imagine, I'm not a huge fan of any sort of top-down project of, of any sort. It makes me very nervous, um, especially when you have such powerful players with very complicated histories like the World Economic Forum or like the United Nations, for example. Um, so- Do you just ignore them? No, not at all. No, no, we, 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 hold, them, <laughs> we hold them directly in front of us um, at all times and- uh, Keep them in our sights. So um, I don't want to punt the question, um, but maybe we can put it in the parking lot for for a couple of minutes and come back to it. Because yeah, yeah if, if we say that this kind of top down managed, and this is a phrase that Klaus Schwab likes to use, a managed kind of stakeholder approach to the problems that confront us globally, if, if, if we're not fans of that particular approach, then what are the alternatives? I think that's a really important question for us to, to be pondering, not just here, but you know, kind of <laughs> as this all rolls forward. So duly noted, let's put that question in the parking lot, other alternatives to this, um, and we'll come back to it. Other, um, other reactions, thoughts so far? Come back here. Uh Rob, I don't think, I do have a question for you. Yeah. I don't see your connections. I have my own ideas, but I want to know your connections between the Great Reset and COVID. Yes, I'm going to get are those that. connections. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to get to that here in a minute. Um, yeah, so thank you for that, Sandy. Before we do that, though, let me, I want to show you just a couple of very short, um, kind of much celebrated... <laughs> <laughs> um, and critiqued videos from the World Economic Forum um, of the past couple of years that capture um, capture a little bit of of kind of where this could go. And I'm just let me queue them up here. Let me find them. There we go. So let's see if this works. Share this. This. Share the sound. All right. So. Um, everybody have a pen or pencil handy? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to show you, I want to, I want to just show you this. It's, it's about a minute and a half long. I think the sound should work. And then um, I'm just curious to sort of jot, just jot down any reactions you have while watching this video. 
and, and I have another one that's even better, but we'll start with this one. So this is called The Great Reset. This was uh, put up on the World Economic Forum's YouTube page. They have 630,000 subscribers, by the way, according to the algorithm here. This video has been viewed um, more than a million and a half times, um, and it's called The Great Reset. So take a look. All right, so take 10 seconds and jot down, if you haven't written anything yet, jot down the most powerful image you remember from that video, the most powerful, what's the first thing, what's the thing that lingers? Just write that down. And we'll go, we'll go right around the Zoom here in 10 seconds. The beautiful fish. Yeah, that that's cool, right? Um, of of swirling fish. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I I love that. Thanks, Robin. Sandy, how about you? Uh, masks. Yeah, there are like a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah, that's a recurring theme, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, which is curious, uh, given that we, we all weren't wearing masks till like April or May of 2020. They rolled this video out June 3rd. That was pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Beth, how about you? One image. I can't hear. Is Beth talking? Well, she may be muted. Oh. Yeah, that's all right. Okay, sorry. That's okay. Um, well, I looked away for a little bit, but the scale of the uh, wind turbines. Yeah, they're huge, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, I can't see other people's names, but please, um, weigh in. Weigh in. Eric, yeah, Eric, you're muted. Yes, that bird, I don't know what it was reaching for, but in the garbage, yeah? The bird in the garbage. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, it was kind of midway through. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, nice. Um, excellent. Mm. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Rob. It's Leslie Becker. Um, hey, Leslie. Hey. Um, it was the contrast between the feeling of disaster at the beginning and the promise of the peaceful images, you know, the fish in particular at the end, and the quick cuts so that I just came away with the feeling of urgency. Mm. Yeah. And just to piggyback on that, I was struck by how how quickly we turned the whole global economy on a dime. Um, yeah. That was that was hopeful, or perhaps a bit simplistic. Um, love it, Leslie. Good to have you here. Um, yeah, it was. I was also saying, Rob, it was a little over promising. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe a little bit of that. Good. Anyone else? Yeah, I guess my name is Jane Hindley. Okay. I would say that they, 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 um, the, the, the machine, the, the machinery that, that they, they, uh, what were they bulldozers? Um, in the midst of all the people, with the people, the bull, the, the, 
the the machine the machinery that was represented felt felt a little threat felt felt threatening to me yeah yeah those big earth movers i'm trying to find them here but i may have, may have passed them by but excellent thank you for sharing that um we'll go on the fish anybody else yeah, the overuse of, you know, climate change and uh, um, ecological disasters images as to, you know, make you feel that, you know, they're on the right side, uh, they're here to heal you. Look how how, how we're going to all die. So we need that reset. <laughs> <laughs> we need to push that button. Please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Maybe. Um, yeah. Maybe the um, general feeling that um, this is all due to overpopulation. Yeah, you do get that sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what kind of tipped you off there? I'm sorry, I can't see who's talking, but uh, that's a great point. Oh, Nancy Rice. Oh, hi, Nancy. Yeah, it I all mean, tipped me off <laughs> because it's yeah, on my it, mind yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and there is a very strong sort of. Um, you know, uh, some would say, I think politely, there's a very strong kind of population control yeah. elements yeah. Uh, embedded in this um, World Economic Forum yeah. set, Fourth Industrial Revolution plan. I, I refer to it, for those of you who are Harry Potter fans, um, I refer to it as the E who must not be named, eugenics. Uh. The, the E who must not be named. Um, as opposed to Voldemort, the evil wizard in Harry Potter, wh who of course is he who must not be named. Right. Um, it's the E who must not be named. And um, yeah, there is, a, there is a very strong sort of element here. And in, in Schwab, I don't want to belabor Klaus Schwab's personal history, but um, if you're interested, you can, you can read more about him. And, and there's definitely some interesting uh, E who must not be named activity uh, in his own Sort of personal background, which I find important and, and fascinating. Well, let me um, let me stop this. Let me show you one more. Um, if I can find it. Where did I put it? I had like multiple tabs open here, so let me find it. Here it is. So this was um, this video actually. Um, let me cue it up here. This video. Um, uh, <laughs> caused quite a con quite some consternation um, when it was uh, was kind of making the rounds. Um, this is from so this is no long <laughs> this video is no longer available on the World Economic Forum YouTube page. They took it down um, for reasons which may become apparent, uh, but it has been it lives on of course in a million, <laughs> in a million different places on on YouTube. Um, it's called the World Economic Forum. By 2030, you'll own nothing, and you'll be happy. <laughs> uh, uh, I have a question. Who put this? Who put this out? So this was put out by the World Economic Forum. They were roundly criticized, and they took it down. And so I just pulled it off of one of the many other sites. Um, um, people, people thought it important to keep this video up. Okay. Um, and play. So let me play it for you. And again, um, watch closely and then maybe jot down a couple of reactions to it. Um, and again, this was produced by Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. Oh, you know what? Hang on. I don't think I clicked the, uh, let me click the sound button. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's good. All right. All right. Here we go. Sorry, right, and let me start it again, because the, the premise here is um, eight predictions, right? Eight predictions for the world in 2030, and they number each one. It, it, you can see the number in the upper left corner of the video screen as they kind of roll through these predictions. So, so I meant to make that clear. So this is the World Economic Forum, eight predictions for the world in nine years. It may make it full screen. How about that? I can. Sometimes that messes with the sound, but let's try it. Um, how's that? Everybody see that? Yeah. yeah, it's oh, good. Oh, excellent. Okay, great. Here we go. Ugh. 
So maybe take five seconds if you haven't curious to jot down a thought or two about that. Maybe we could talk for a moment about why you think that was so controversial. <laughs> why it provoked so much consternation. <clears throat> Total control. Yeah. Well, and, By and, whom though? By whom? Yeah. Yeah. And Robin, like, wh where in that 90 seconds did you feel that most strongly, would you say? Mm. I'm just thinking back. I mean, a lot of the things are actually very good. Um, things that one would want. Um, such as? Yeah, such as? Well, uh, uh, controlling um fossil fuels and uh i mean i have an an earlier complaint you called it eugenics i would say contraceptives uh mm. i mean the population population is a problem in terms of dealing with climate change that have to has to be figured out <clears throat> yeah one way or another um good other um, other reactions? Um, I would like to say about both videos, you know what they ignore totally is war and the military. Right. They ignore that to, I think, disastrous analysis. The problem with much of the world, including the emission of fossil fuels, is war. I don't understand why that is eliminated from all that consideration is eliminated even from any discussions of climate change. Yeah, I, I think I don't get it. I don't approve. I don't. I totally disagree with it. And it's one of my <laughs> biggest disagreements with the yeah. climate change movement. But it's done on purpose. To why? me, it's done on purpose, especially you know these videos. Be because I've been working on videos and mass media, and then it's made to, of course, you can't deny that there will be disasters, but don't, don't, uh, don't scare people. Huh? Give them the sense that, you know, we control the situation. People, look, it starts in, in some years, you won't even owe nothing and you'll be happy. So <laughs> it's more of the a cult, you know, and a brainwashing. I mean, it's like, it's very, very uh, pernicious, yes. yeah? very, very pernicious. Yeah, and you know, the, the use of phrases like the sharing economy, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, was sort of introduced about 10 years ago. And, um, you know, Uber, um, just to give one example, Uber and Lyft, you know, kind of ride sharing apps are gonna make, you know, the private ownership of cars obsolete. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to Robin's point, well, maybe that's a good thing because cars, you know, use fossil fuel. But to Sandy's point, um, we're, we're burning collectively 8 billion of us on the planet. Last time I checked, we're burning 90 billion, sorry, 90 million barrels of oil a day. And there's about, I think it's 60 gallons of oil in a barrel. Um, 
the biggest oil burning country, of course, is the United States at 22 million barrels a day. And the biggest single oil burning organization is the Pentagon. Yeah. At, at a million barrels of oil a day to kind of keep the US imperial war machine chugging along. So yeah, there, you're, I, I tend to agree with you, Sandy. And, and I talk with my students about this in my environmental history and policy classes. Um, to critique climate change without critiquing war mm. and war making empires seems a fool's errand. Exactly, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it, never have. Yeah, um, so other, uh, other, other reactions here to this 92nd, we will own nothing and be happy by 2030. Well, when it says Western values will have been tested to the breaking point, what Western values are they talking about? I, 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 left, I, left this, I left the still shot here for a reason, because I think this is like the most interesting part of the video for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. What Western values? Democracy? Representative yeah. government? Privacy? Yeah. Uh, the oh. sanctity of private property? Uh, the sanctity of human individual rights as enshrined by the Bill of Rights or uh, the Nuremberg Code after World War II, informed consent, health freedom, to bring it back around to COVID? You know, it's, it, it's a great question. Great question. Well, and they oh. haven't mentioned anything wanna... about eating food. <laughs> well, they did mention we're going to eat far less meat. Yeah, they did. Less uh... meat. Yeah. 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 Well, and what... and you know, of course, that um, that that Bill Gates and Ted Turner and a lot of these uh, Davos crowd types are investing heavily in farmland, right. across, not just the United States but the world, and they're also investing heavily in faux meat. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd say that as a guy married to a vegan who is forced to eat a Beyond Beef burger once a week, um, <laughs> and uh, it's it's a let's say it's a fascinating gastronomic exercise, let's say. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, other other thoughts, reactions. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. Well, um, it's still saying that it. I mean, the, well, I I tend to believe. I think the beef producers are, are still, I can't imagine that they're not going to be very powerful. They've been, um, they, the jungle, of the, when the jungle was written, it seems like it, um, about their power, about um, the, the, the disgusting things that they, that, that, the, that, the, that, the, beef, that the meat producers do. It seems to be holding still true today in, in, in COVID and they seem to have a lot of power. I can't, I don't, I, I guess I guess I'm puzzled to where they think what, that we will. I mean, besides that, besides that, meat substitutes exist. I I I still think that the beef that the, that the beef producers will be will be will be powerful. Um, and also, well, I mean, I don't know. Well, and um, well, I mean, where does where where how will they will how will they give up power? And um, where and the idea i mean it, it was i mean i mean the con the con yeah they they, they did they, they do talk about concentration of power um but they don't I'd, I'd like to hear that elaborated more um with with just with, with just a few governments yeah but. yeah it's a great it's a great question and and just to your point about beef i i i find this sort of an arresting image. Um, and <laughs> some of you know, I'm a retired grass fed yak beef farmer. So <laughs> I'm actually a big fan of decentralized grass fed meat production. Uh, I'm no fan of, uh, you know, CAFOs and concentrated animal feedlots and that sort of thing. I think that's, those are abhorrent. But it's curious to Eric's point about storytelling and digital media and production that um, when they're making an argument uh, for eating less meat, they show us kind of a pristine forest. And anybody who's familiar with uh, the power of agriculture as a destructive force on the landscape might at, at this moment in the video ask themselves the question uh, about uh, how, how intensive agriculture is, um, is as destructive a force as say intensive cattle ranching or maybe in a different sort of way. Anyway, that's, that, that was one thing that sort of came to my mind um, here. Yeah, all, all these videos, you know, all these videos, there's no way to question why do we have climate change, why we have these disasters. 
there's always a solution. And in this instance, the solution will be money. We pay for carbon so we can pollute as much as we can. No mention of, you know, uh, 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 and growth instead of, you know, like we are always in this uh, line of perpetual growth. We'll find solutions. Don't worry. You don't have to have anything in your pocket. We'll take care of you. So it's very pernicious. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not only top down, it's sort of paternalistic in a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of Robin's point of earlier about sort of the top down approach. And if not that, then what? Right. Um, in terms of grappling with these, these big problems. Well, um, let's do this. Um, let's, uh, 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 yeah, can please. I make one more comment? Maybe? Yeah, yeah. It also ignores crucial individual rights. Mm. They're in these schemes, what they're really talking about, the destruction of Western values, a key Western value is the sovereignty of the individual conscience. And that will be destroyed by the type of control these people want over everyone's lives, including the control over women's bodies. When they're talking about overpopulation, what they really mean is that women have to uh, address that in some way. They have to, like in China, be mandated how many births they're gonna have, how many abortions they're going to be mandated to have in a place like China, and how though the, the, the population problem is gonna be solved by government control of women and not by women themselves. If you, if you really want to address population, which I question really, if you really want to address population, you empower women to make those decisions about their reproductive lives. No mention of that anywhere. Mm. Well, no, the population organizations talk about that all the time. That's their big thing, empower women. Good, but this does not, is what I'm trying to say. The World Economic Forum does not value individual moral choices. Yeah. And those choices have to be made by the government, the government meaning the government that Rob is talking about, the partnership between global governments the, U the UN, big capital, and big, uh, big pharma, big media, big capitalists. That's what they're really talking about is control by those people. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, when they say that uh, you will own nothing, who they don't address who will own it. Yeah. Good point. Um, Good the point. whole thing seems kind of dystopian to me, Rob. It reminds me of Sut Jolly's advertising in the end of the world video, if you remember that. Oh, very well. <laughs> um, yes. I, I, I didn't understand the bit about printing organs. Yeah. Uh, that seemed kind of crazy. It, it did seem to me that it shouldn't be so shocking as Robin said that, that we would eat less meat and that polluters would pay to pollute. But basically I, I would love Rob to hear your you know, media literacy analysis of these and, and what are they preparing us for? What is the, if you look at this all together, what's, what, are, what are they doing? Yeah, it's, Leslie, it's a great question. And that's maybe a good segue, actually, to um, um, the link between the Great Reset's Fourth Industrial Revolution and what I'm calling COVID-topia. Um, because I, I think the answer to your question, Leslie, lies in um, sort of an understanding of how, um, how the COVID protocols are sort of priming us for what is to come. So let me share, let's call this up here. So let me be very provocative for a few moments if that's okay, because I know this group likes to be provocative. Leslie, I love that you referenced Sut Jolly's advertising in the end of the world. It's fantastic. Um, so, um, let's see if I should make this, oops. So, um, this is the, the cover for this book called COVIDtopia. It's a picture of the earth surrounded by spike, po spike proteins, <laughs> which somehow seems sort of appropriate to me. Um, and the subtitle here, 10 Truths About Viral Tyranny, Health Freedom, and Human Destiny in an Age of Planetary Techno-Fascism, which again, I think is another word, techno-fascism, for that marriage of state and corporate power in a digital matrix. So um, 
10 truths about the COVID and think of COVID, at least I'm thinking about COVID and you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but I'm thinking about uh, COVID uh, or the COVID protocols as a dress rehearsal for the world in 2030 as imagined by the World Economic Forum and, and Klaus Schwab after the Great Reset kicks off the fourth industrial revolution. And by the way, how many of you have seen um, Jeff Gibbs's recent film uh, executively produced by Michael Moore, the Michael Moore, uh, called Planet of the Humans? Anybody no. seen Planet of the Humans? No. Yeah. Yeah, make a note. It, it was off YouTube for a while. It's yeah. back up again. I think Good. you can run it for a couple of bucks. But, you know, Gibbs was the one who did uh, An Inconvenient Truth with Al Gore ah, in right. 2005, 2006. And he kind of went rogue on the environmental movement. And to be clear, I'm, I've been an environmentalist for 30 years. And I'm an environmentalist. I teach environmental history. It's my subject of PhD study. So I'm, I'm, I'm in the camp, although increasingly I feel a bit more like a maverick because uh, mm -hmm. what Gibbs argues in Planet of the Humans is that the mainstream environmental movement has essentially turned over the future of the planet and humanity to this fourth industrial revolution, which is being run by this techno-fascist elite. The, you know, the bandits and the Black Rocks and the Goldman Sachs's and the, um, you know, the hedge fund managers and the bond, the bond people, et cetera, et cetera. So um, people think it's a movie about renewable energy, Planet of the Humans, and it is about that, but it's also about it, it's the most trenchant critique I've seen mm -hmm. of the marriage between the mainstream environmental movement, which is obsessed with the UN version of climate change, you know, carbon reduction, et cetera, um, and this fourth industrial revolution. It's a really important movie, Planet of the Humans. Um, not that it's completely accurate, of course, but it's an important text. All right, so let me just run you through kind of 10 truths. And, and I have to tell you, I've been obsessed with the COVID. Um, I've spent at least one or two hours a day when I'm not working and chasing my children and doing other things, um, deep into the COVID research ever since the day Governor Scott declared the emergency, which was the day after I was on top of camel's hump in the snow and the wind and the cold with my daughter my 21 year old daughter who had just returned early from the country of Bhutan, where she was doing a study abroad semester because they shut down Bhutan. It was one of the first countries to be shut down. Um, and so she and I, she came home, we got her out of Bhutan, we got her through India, we got her back home. And she and I went for this really lovely hike up to the top of Camel's Hump. And then of course, the next day we were, we were sheltering in place for two weeks to flatten the curve. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, at that point, I realized something strange was going on. So I just started taking notes and, and, and reading everything I could get my hands on and talking to everybody that would talk to me and watching and reading medical papers and scientific journals and blah, blah, blah. So um, feel free to argue with me about any of these. I'm just going to lay them out. But if you're interested in finding out more about any of them, you can type any one of these words or phrases into the Vermont Independent Spyglass search engine and you will get hundreds of entries from my travels about how I came to these conclusions. So um, let me blow through them. So uh, the, the first truth is that outsourcing all human decision-making to virologists, and not just virologists, but a very small group of them mm -hmm. has ushered in a civilizational COVID catastrophe. We've turned over our civilizational thinking um, to a single suspect science virology. And again, a handful of them, virologists. Um, Anthony Fauci being sort of the most obvious poster boy for this argument. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of virologists around the world who are on public record as opposing all of these COVID protocols. You just never hear their voices much. If you haven't read um, the Great Barrington Declaration, which has now been signed by close to a million PhDs and medical professionals around the world. The Great Barrington Declaration, which calls for focused protection of the elderly and the immunocompromised, but let's let the rest free. It's a very important document. Anyway, 
So uh, the second truth, as, as we're now beginning to learn, finally, um, we reported on this at Vermont Independent a year and a half ago, the novel SARS-CoV-2 virus is a chimeric virus, which is to say it's a hybridized, human-made virus funded in part by the U.S. National Institute of Health, that's Fauci's organization, and weaponized via gain of function lab experimentation. And this goes back almost 20 years in a collaboration between China and the United States. And it took getting Trump out of office and people waking up from their slumber and getting over their Trump derangement syndrome so that we could actually have an honest conversation about this. It's, it's a shame it took so long. If you didn't see the comedian John Stewart yeah. on, on Stephen Colbert's show three nights ago, talking to the camera about this because Colbert refused to entertain the conversation. You can watch that on YouTube. It was fascinating. Yeah, I saw it. It was fascinating and long overdue, long overdue. So truth number three, COVID's, uh, COVIDtopia. So I refer to COVIDtopia as kind of this imagined utopian community where we're all going to be completely safe because we're all locked in our homes, masked with pizzas being shoved under the door and we've collapsed our small business economy and destroyed the next generation of children by punishing them with all of these grotesque abusive practices. That's COVIDtopia, right? So COVIDtopia's biggest beneficiaries fund and fuel the 24 seven mainstream media news coverage about this event. I hope that's obvious to most of you. All you have to do is watch the advertisements in between segments of Rachel Maddow or Loyal, Laura Ingram or Tucker Carlson or Wolf Blitzer or whoever. And Leslie, of course, I'm channeling our, our good work in the media literacy space for that one. Um, chapter four, uh, sorry, truth number four, big tech. I've never seen so much censorship on big tech platforms on anything as I have with the COVID. Censors in US and the mainstream media marginalizes all COVID questions and debates. I myself have had half a dozen videos removed from YouTube simply for talking about the COVID. Probably. It's fascinating. My, my, my reporting at Vermont Independent is littered with dead YouTube links from videos of medical professionals, doctors, PhDs from around the world sounding the alarm on this and having their voices systematically removed. It's like a graveyard. Wow. Yeah, people are like, Rob, you should take those down and replace them with links to BitChute and Odyssey, you know, <laughs> streaming platforms where they're not being censored. Like, oh no, I want people to remember just how much censorship there has been and continues to be. I had a video removed last week. Fascinating. Um, number five, I'll highlight that might help. Um, truth number five, COVID, so this has to do with COVID death data. COVID conflict of interest, computer modeling and death data counting are inaccurate, misleading, and dangerous. And again, we had to have Trump thrown out of office so we could have an honest conversation about this. But the CDC has admitted to dramatically overinflating the data. So we have no idea, actually, how many Americans have been killed and how many global citizens have been killed from the COVID. We, I don't think we know. I don't think we know. We hear the drumbeat all the time, but I don't think we know. Um, the PCR testing, which of course the state of Vermont adopted much to my chagrin. Um, COVID PCR testing, truth number six, is scientifically unreliable and dangerous to human sovereignty. But from a World Economic Forum Great Reset Fourth Industrial Revolution perspective, you can use scientific testing and computer modeling to scare fear monger and control populations of humans. And that's what has happened. If you don't know, the inventor of the polymerase chain reaction test, he won a Nobel prize in chemistry for inventing the PCR test, said he died a year and a half ago. Anyone know his name? No. His name is, it was Kerry Mullis, M-U-L-L-I-S. You can watch him on YouTube. He said, this is a test that should never ever be used for viral detection. I invented the polymerase chain reaction test for lab procedures that demanded the amplification of certain types of genetic material, but it should never be used for viral measurement, which of course is what happened. 
and the state of Vermont and Mark Levine and Governor Scott sanctioned a PCR testing process that amplified cycle threshold of PCR tests above their scientific utility, which is to say, if you run a PCR test at above 32 cycles per cycle threshold, the test becomes useless. You get 97, 98% false positives. So we built an entire COVID protocol system on a test whose very inventor warned us should never be used for that purpose. It's astonishing. It's astonishing. Is that thought, the mainstream uh, test that's used nationally and internationally? So that PCR protocol was developed by a German virologist named Christian Drosten, who was funded by the Gates Foundation. And the World Health Organization adopted Drosten's PCR test protocols in February, right before things went south of 2020. Um, I think a dozen other German virologists have now sued Drosten uh, in German yeah. courts yeah. to prove that his test was not only inaccurate, but dangerous because it provided medical misinformation for otherwise healthy humans who were then locked down and have been subjected to everything we're familiar with. Same way with uh, HIV AIDS. How yeah. it was, uh, was in the system over there. We died like from the medication and the over medication in Africa. Than... Yes, well, you're, you're right. It's interesting. There's a whole history. The book, yeah. um, the book Virus Mania, which is just coming out in the second yeah. edition, um, the book Virus Mania is probably the best history of, of, of that. And it's, it's incredibly important. Yeah. So um, getting back to the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So um, COVIDtopia thrives on human fear and dependency. Right. And I, if you think about how we're going to top down manage the human species and convince them that this Great Reset and this Fourth Industrial Revolution, where we marry the biological, the digital, and the technological, we marry those things together as a species, you need to you need to instill fear and dependence in humans to get them to go along with this. And as I write here, humans at their best exhibit conscience, courage, and independence. Right. And I just gave two examples, entrepreneurs and citizens who like to peaceably gather and exchange news information and challenge established authority, which is of course well, enshrined in our first amendment. Right. I, I, yeah, something doesn't, doesn't ring quite right because independence is um, what is is what I think Trump 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 folks would agree with you and in, in independence even from even from the rules of the rules of law of law there's uh, yeah so maybe we could we could change that to interdependence um, although I would argue that. Um, we as individuals do no one any favors starting with ourselves if we ourselves are dependent and scared and fearful um, and not optimized to our full potential, which if you know anyone who feels like they've been optimized to their full potential the past 18 months, I'd love to talk with them. Mm. Um, but, but, but case in point or, or point taken. Um, so this, no one will like this one, but I'm gonna say it anyway, um, masks. Masks are ineffective at suppressing COVID and cause myriad harms to mask wearers. I've been studying breath work for a long time. The first thing I did when the mask protocol came down was I went and I read every single legitimate peer reviewed scientific study I could get my hands on. These are randomized control trials with verifiable results. There's about 30 of them, including some meta studies and every single one of them came to this particular conclusion. Every single medical organization came to this conclusion. Dr. Fauci said this on 60 Minutes before he reversed course. And if you've read his private email dump of 3,200 emails from two weeks ago, he admitted privately on a number of occasions in private emails that this was true. How is it spread then? Let's come back to that. <laughs> No, it, it's an important it's an important question, but I um, but we'll have time. We'll have time. Rob, uh, Amy Hornblast's study. Oh yes, and Amy, um, I, I've been really supportive of Amy. Um, if you don't know Amy Hornblast, she's a public health um, advocate. Uh, she lives up in I think in the 
Callis, Plainfield area, I think. But but she Marshfield. actually, where is it? Marshfield. Marshfield, thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, and she actually has conducted a statewide poll of uh, Vermonters who have been forced to wear masks for their jobs, et cetera. I, I signed three different contracts to wear a facial covering to teach on campus. Um, and I signed a contract to wear a facial covering last year at the farmer's market to run my small yak cart business. And let me tell you, it was most unpleasant. And I, I, I had a choice, I made the choice, but I, I, I'm not back at the farmer's market this summer because I didn't want to do that again. Fortunately, we're opening up, that's nice. Um, okay, the vaccines. All right, and, and I'm going to use air quotes here. Uh, COVID vaccines disguise experimental, untested human cell reprogramming gene therapy technologies whose health consequences, pro or con, remain unknown, although that is changing. That is changing. Um, this is a very controversial one, I know. Um, the inventor of mRNA technology, Dr. Robert Malone, has just gone on record last week as saying he is deeply concerned about the um, emergency use of these untrialed technologies because we simply don't have clinical trial data. If you read the fine print from the pharmaceutical companies who claimed that these technologies were safe and effective based on their trial data, they cherry picked the data. And if you're curious to find out more about how they did this, it's in the Truth About COVID-19 book, the one I shared with you earlier. And I've written quite extensively about how they did this at Vermont Independent. It's very important that people understand this. There is no clinical trial data. And I'm sorry if you've gotten the injections, you are part of the experiment. You are part of the trial. And it brings me no joy to say that. My, my entire family has made that decision. I have not, it's been very difficult. Um, and then finally, number 10, COVID will, never go, <laughs> COVID will never go away if the COVID-topians have their way. And I would argue that the COVID-topians overlap quite extensively with Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, the Davos crowd, the Gates crowd. I mean, they're all more or less all at the same cocktail parties having the same conversations about the future of the human species. So, and then my conclusion, of course, we have to transcend this. So those are sort of 10 viral truths that it's taken me 18 months to sort of begin to figure out. Um, and I use the word truth with a small T, not a capital T, because it's an evolving conversation and we're learning more and more every day. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that. Um, so um, so um, we just have about 15 minutes and I hope that I, so, so just to sort of wrap that up. So in my mind, if you wanna understand the great reset, and the fourth industrial revolution and what these people like Klaus Schwab have in store for the human species, simply look at the past 18 months of COVID protocols and you'll get a pretty clear sense of the direction they want us to go. Constant surveillance, a complete loss of privacy, economic dependence instead of independence or to uh, our point of earlier, interdependence. Um, um, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, huh. so, what happened to the virus spread? So how many of you are familiar with the difference between germ theory and terrain theory? And what? What's the second one? Terrain, T-E-R-R-A-N, like uh, the landscape, terrain, terrain theory. Not me. So this is a very important distinction, and I, I've written quite a bit about this at Vermont Independent. So let me put it, let me give you an example. Um, if you have an aquarium in your living room and the fish in your aquarium are sick, they are diseased, a germ theorist would say, vaccinate the fish. A terrain theorist would say, clean the tank water. Yeah, yeah. In other words, uh, terrain theory um, suggests, and there's a, there's a 200 year old debate between the terrain theorists and the germ theorists. The germ theorists are winning right now, by the way, you may have figured that out, um, over how diseases like alleged viruses, which are allegedly contagious, allegedly spread, 
from one human to another, from one species to another. If they go zoonotic, they jump species, right? This is, was the official story for a long time. I think it's been disproven or is yeah. it not? So um, when people say, well, I am sick with COVID-19 or the symptoms that we're calling COVID-19, the assumption we've been programmed to make because of 18 months of 24 seven COVID agenda, let's say, um, is that there is a contagious disease running amok that is spread from human to human virally transmitted. The much more interesting question I think scientifically is to look at terrain theory and try and figure out what other factors in our air, water, um, uh, food, our mental environments, our, our psycho-spiritual environment may also be contributing to people's sense of disease and, um, and lack of health. And I realize if you've never heard of terrain theory before, this might sound a little suspect, but I'd encourage you uh, to, to, um, to do, some, do some, some digging about that. Um, for the COVID project to succeed and for the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution to succeed, humans <laughs> have to accept germ theory as the dominant medical paradigm. Okay, yeah. In I reality, and this is science and the scientific method that work, right? In reality, we, we, need to have a, we need to have an intense and vigorous and robust public conversation about what constitutes health, what constitutes dis-ease, where these uh, disease, um, uh, diseases are and how they're being manifest. And again, the book Virus Mania is fantastic, yeah. Yeah. fantastic on this point. A uh, very, very important book. Um, doctors who've done really good work on this. Um, uh, Children's Health Defense, Kennedy's Organization, uh -huh. uh, Dell Bigtree at the High Wire. These people, have, of, of course, are accused of being anti-vaxxers, which is a, a nonsensical term for the COVID vaccines since they're not even vaccines at all by any historical or medical or legal definition. These are experimental mRNA or adenovirus DNA technologies. These are not, these are not traditional vaccines, as mm. I'm sure you know. So um, who else? Virus mania, uh, Dr. Thomas Cowan, Dr. Andrew Kaufman. Th there's, a, there's a number of, right. of, of whistleblowing doctors and medical professionals who are coming out and challenging germ theory itself, right. which the entire science of virology is built upon from the invention right. of the electron microscope all the way back to Edward Jenner and, and the smallpox, the cowpox experiments in, in England. Um, and let me sh throw in another, ex uh, another really important book on this, by the way, uh, another Chelsea Green book um, by Robert, uh, sorry, Arthur Furstenberg, a book called The Invisible Rainbow, which is a, an environmental history of electricity. It came out um, a year and a half ago. It's, if you read, no, if you read, if you want to read two books that bookend the COVIDtopia, read an invisible rainbow and read the truth about COVID-19 and support a Vermont state publishing house. Support Margot Baldwin, one of the most powerful women publishers in the business. God knows she needs it right about now. <laughs> That's for sure. Okay, but then how does it spread? Um, so how do you think it spreads? <laughs> to spit. And who told you that? the the people the medical people in charge that's why you wear a, wear a mask to keep the sputum inside so the little germs that are on your spit don't fly off to someone else yes and that's why doctors and nurses wear surgical masks in the operating room and change them every 20 minutes um, they wear n95 masks because they don't want anything anything sand from their eyelash right yeah, a piece of mucus from their nostril, right? A skin, skin from a scab that they have. On. They don't want anything falling into that, that antiseptically sanitized surgical arena, right? Um, I'd encourage you to read the, um, the randomized controlled trials with um, verifiable results about experiments done with mask wearing and viruses. Um, 
in all instances, what they've discovered is that viromic particles are much smaller than any kind of mask. Even the N95s are only good for a few minutes as any surgeon or nurse in the operating room will tell you. Um, the analogy I like to use is wearing a mask to stop a virus is like wrapping your face in chain link fence to stop a mosquito. Well, 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 that's why you also have to do practice social distancing as well, and that has, and that, and that, and that has slowed the vir the, the, the virus. It's, it's people crowding together, and not wearing masks. Yeah, but so, you know the, the the social distance then touches the uh, terrain terrain uh, theory because it's like how can't you get a virus in a city like New York? where millions of people who don't even wash their hands, I'm not saying, you know, some people, you know, you don't know what, you know, someone touched, you know, you go to a, a subway with like millions of millions. And most of the, these diseases are, you know, appearing where you have overpopulated areas where, you know, you know, we used to be, we are, we are a species that, you know, used to, to live in like some decently crowded environment. Now we are millions and millions, you know, using the subway, you know. So I think it's interesting also to look at the terrain, you know, theory as a way to understand that. Yeah, I, lo I love that point, Eric. You're right. And to Jane's point too, M MIT itself, believe it or not, just a, a month ago uh, published a new study saying that the, 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 the six foot or three meter in, in the UK physical distancing requirement was basically arbitrary. And, and simplistic and, and didn't really sort of address the question that Robin is asking about mm -hmm. how is this thing transmitted? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you put what you just said, Eric, it's really important. If you, if you, if you lay terrain theory over Robin's question, which mm -hmm. is how is this thing transmitted? Um, it, it's very complex. It becomes a very complex and interesting conversation, right? For example, we are bioelectric creatures, right? Every living thing is shot through with electromagnetic energy. We sort of forget that, but you know, this is the quantum physicists have taught us this for decades. They're kind of catching up with the mystics, right? Um, but we know that everyone's body, including all living creatures, right down to our cells, um, have uh, communicate with electrical impulses. Mm -hmm. And there's some indication that that has something to do with the way in which diseases contagious diseases are transmitted. Um, we don't fully understand it. We, we barely are beginning to understand it in part because we've so embraced germ theory that we've sort of neglected to sort of look at that terrain mm -hmm. theory stuff. And that's why a, a book like Invisible Rainbow or the work of some of these whistleblowing doctors who are really trying to bring terrain theory back to the conversation. It's why it's so important. It's why it's so important. COVID long haulers, by the way, you're familiar with the phrase, I'm sure. The long haulers, mm -hmm. right? The ones who allegedly got sick from a contagious virus and have not been able to recover for months and months. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that, that terrain theory is actually quite useful in, in helping to figure out how to treat these COVID long haulers. By the way, the number one antidote to long haul COVID is breath work. Yeah. They've been piling yeah. this at Mount yeah. Sinai Hospital and uh, was just written up in the, Atlanta, in the Atlantic Magazine in March. Um, light breathing exercises strategically yeah. have been found to reduce people's anxiety, stress levels, fear, their memory fog clears up, their, um, yeah. their addresses a number of long haul COVID symptoms in a very powerful way. And again, we're just beginning to sort of figure this out. Uh, so I have like five minutes left, Sandy, yeah. Because <laughs> I just read about lung rehabilitation therapy. And that's, that is, I think it was even in the, maybe even in the New York Review of Books, that lungs can be rehabilitated through kinds of stuff you're talking about, through the exercise of the lungs. Um, and again, that seems to be more productive in long haul cases than medication or anything else is the rebuilding of the lungs yeah the respiratory system is such a central yeah. central uh, part of our, our our moment by moment existence quite literally yeah. yeah and we're so out of touch with it right now it's quite it's quite astonishing actually
yeah. So the response is holistic then, you know, how yeah. organization yeah. will be, you yeah. know, how we're going to approach medicine, how, you know, and then a central point to me, and then I realize it like, I, thanks to her, you know, all these series on Netflix and not going to the movies and, you know, you like stay up like around till uh, 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 midnight. And after five days of doing that, your immune system, you know, just drops and then you get sick. So the human system is a central point and everything that affects the theory, the terrain, the, 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 you know, the electricity, you know, the, 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 uh, the electromagnetic, everything, you know, touches the, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, human system and then voila, we, you know, so it's a holistic approach, I think. Yeah. And I'm so glad you said that, Eric and, and virology, Virologists, like every other specialized science, pushes us into a very narrow understanding, a very mm. narrow niche understanding, a reductive understanding of human health versus human mm. disease. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I know we're just, I, I just, uh, I'm looking at the chat here and I see Greg uh, Guma weighed in a while ago about components of the fourth industrial revolution, interconnection, information, transparency, technical assistance, decentralized decision-making. There are variants of the fourth industrial revolution. I was asked to talk tonight about the great reset, um, which of course brought us around to Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. Yeah. And their, their particular interpretation of uh, um, the great reset as a catalyst for the fourth industrial revolution and, and COVID as kind of a dress rehearsal. And make no mistake, um, you know, we may get a reprieve this summer. I certainly hope so. but. The Covetopians are going to keep working on what they do best, which is everything we're familiar with. So I like I, I like uh, Greg's point here that it's really up to us individually and interdependently. It's up to us to chart our own course forward as we move into this brave new world. Mm -hmm. And and I think really to Eric's point of a minute ago, really thinking and feeling and instincting holistically. Mm -hmm. Um, in our communities, our schools, our workplaces is, is I, I, I can't say it's so important. It's so important. We really need to sort of take off the masks and hug each other again and figure out ways to kind of challenge this great reset top down to Robin's point of earlier top down narrative. And again, read Klaus Schwab's book. Like as if your life depended on it <laughs> and read the truth about COVID-19. It's counter as if your life depended on it, because they really do give you two beautifully different points of view on on this brave new world we're moving into. And virus mania. And virus mania. And right. if you're following uh, Sam Bailey is a doctor out of New Zealand, he's the new editor on this book, and she is a real courageous woman. Um, and uh, really, really a smart cat as well. And I've, I've learned a lot from from her over the past 18 months, as I have from a lot of different whistleblowing docs and virologists around the world. So, um, well, I know we're about out of time. This has been really, really fun. I, I hope it's been fun for you. Um, Vermontindependent.net is where you can find all the stuff we just talked about. Um, it's the most recent story. If you scroll down to the uh, below the fold, um, all of these documents and videos and all that stuff, books are there. So I hope you'll avail yourselves of those and spread the good word and um, I really hope all of you will get outside this summer and enjoy being fully human again and in the company of your friends and family and neighbors and uh, talk to each other and, and listen to each other. And I, I so appreciate the work that Vicki is doing. And I, I visited the school uh, or the center where Sandy's has an office. And that's, that's a really important little place in Burlington. And we got we to gotta keep nurturing that too. So Mm. Can I say one thing about uh, Rob that I didn't mention before <laughs> we quit? And that is that I first met Rob through his uh, struggle for Vermont independence from this great United States. And he was basically described himself, I hope I'm getting this right, as a secessionist. He was in favor of Vermont seceding from the Union. And the way that our poor Union is going it's not such a bad idea, I, although I hope that Vermont would keep the basic principles of the United States, which is liberty, justice, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you.
Thanks, Sam, thanks. And, and maybe if I can say one more thing about that, you know, I, I think Team Human right now in the United States and Vermont, we're caught between a nationalist rock and a globalist hard place. Yeah, right. And, and I'm I, honestly, I'm not sure which is worse. <laughs> so, but yes, if we can maintain our sanity and our love for one another and courage and, and human, genuine human relationships and interrelationships, um, I, I think that can only help. Um, so, so thanks to everybody, and, and I hope you have a good rest of your week, and I hope to see all of you in, in Berlin. Hey, by the way, mention your food truck. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We'll start rolling the, uh, the, the grass-fed, locally grown Vermont yak meat, yakitumi food cart at the Warren 4th of July parade, the largest parade in Vermont for the 4th. So if you happen to be uh, down in the town of Warren, come see us, or uh, um, we'll be at the Roundup in Waitsfield every Wednesday afternoon. So come down and hear some live music, and jump in the river and have some fun. All right, thank you. Anybody All else? Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Thanks very much. Yeah. See you next yeah. week where the People's Law School is going to present their session on employment law. Thank you all for being here tonight. See ya. Thanks everybody, be well. Yeah, you too, Rob. See you soon. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.